Today, we're gonna to continue to talk about complex numbers. The big thing that we discovered last time was that a complex number has n nth roots. A complex number has n nth roots. I should say n complex nth roots. Mm -hmm. So that would be two square roots, three cube roots, four fourth roots, and so on. Whatever root we're doing, that's how many there are. Furthermore, they're evenly spaced in the complex plane. They are 360 divided by n degrees apart in the complex plane. I already said degrees. That's one of the cool things that we discovered last time. So square roots will be 180 degrees apart. So here's the origin. Hundred and eighty degrees apart. Cube roots are going to be three sixty over three uh, one twenty degrees apart. Fourth roots will be 90 degrees apart, 360 divided by four. Fifth roots will be 72 degrees apart and so on. So we had this way of describing complex numbers that was both using Cartesian coordinates, A plus BI, and rectangular coordinates, or sorry, polar coordinates, where we have a distance and an angle. So remember that we describe complex numbers in the complex plane where there's a real axis and an imaginary axis, a number will be in rectangular coordinates A plus BI, or in polar coordinates, a distance R from the origin at an angle of theta. So we have rectangular coordinates A plus BI and polar coordinates R and theta. So last time, if you will recall, we know that the cube root of eight, so eight has, should have three cube roots, three complex cube roots.
one of them is real. One cube root of eight is two. So there's one real cube root, and there must be two complex cube roots. I guess the real root is also a complex root. So I mean, but when I say too complex, complex and not real. Not real in the sense of real numbers. They're definitely real numbers. They're just not real numbers. We really messed up by calling the real number system the real numbers and distinguishing them from the imaginary numbers. That was a huge mistake. I wasn't at this meeting. I'm sure someone brought up like, well, it's gonna be a real problem if we start calling these real numbers. But everybody's like, oh, ah, it'll be fine. We all know what we're talking about. And then everybody's like, oh, and then someone's like, oh, well, it's gonna be difficult for people to learn. And that, that's, that's all I'm concerned about. And then everybody in the room is like, oh, bah, we had it tough. So everybody else needs to have it tough too. And then the rest of us are like, oh, dude, that's the opposite of what we should be doing. We should look at how hard we had it and say, man, that was stupid. I wonder if there's a better way. But anyway, here we are. I'm sure that line of thinking never went anywhere. For thousands of years. Oh, that's right, it didn't because we're still doing it. What a garbage species. What were we talking about? Oh yes, eight has three complex cube roots. One real and then two are complex and not real. And they should be 120 degrees apart. So we know on the complex number plane, draw the circle first. If we draw a circle of radius two, one of our, re our real zeros happens here at two uh, zero. two plus zero i. We're gonna find two complex that, uh, zeros, two more complex zeros, and they're gonna be 120 degrees apart. So we should expect one up here. And the other one down here. And these should be all 120 degrees apart. And that's gonna allow us to figure out what those other two roots are. We're gonna come at this from a polar coordinate standpoint, and then we're gonna come at it from an algebraic standpoint. So let's check it out. So, if we have an angle of 120 degrees, that's gonna be a 60 degree, 60 degree reference angle in the second and third quadrants. So if I'm just gonna grab this one up here in the second quadrant, I've got this hypotenuse of two and a reference angle of 60 degrees. I'm gonna need more hypotenuse to clear the 60. We can use this information to figure out the coordinates of the point up here, the rectangular coordinates, because I need to know the opposites and the adjacent. The adjacent is gonna be the cosine, two times the cosine of 60, and the opposite will be two times the sine of 60. So the adjacent, is two times the cosine of 60 degrees. 
So that's going to be uh, cosine of 60 is a half. So two times a half or one. And the opposite is going to be two times the sine of 60. So that's going to be two times root three over two, oh, which is square root of three. But we notice that we're in the second quadrant and cosine is negative. So I shouldn't have written 60, I should have written 120. But we just note that the x coordinate will be negative one and the y coordinate, which is the sine, is gonna be positive square root of three. Now for the one down here, we still just flip this up over and the x coordinate is still negative one, but now the y coordinate is negative root three. So my claim is that negative one plus i times the square root of three are uh, negative one plus or minus i times the square root of three are the two complex uh, cube roots of eight. Because they're, those are the points on the circle with radius two that are 120 degrees away from two zero. Let's verify this. We'll take negative one plus i times the square root of three and cube it. Promptly run out of space. So we're trying to verify that negative one plus i times the square root of three cubed is equal to eight. So let's just, let's, let's do this. So I'm gonna have negative one cubed plus three times negative one squared times i times the square root of three plus three times negative one to the first times i times the square root of three squared plus i times the square root of three cubed. Now this is what we would get if we made three copies of negative one plus i times the square root of three. Since this is a binomial, it's just a cube of a binomial, I'm gonna use the binomial theorem to multiply this out. And I'm gonna grab the coefficients from Pascal's triangle and I'm count the first, first term, three, two, one, zero in power, and the second one, second term, zero, one, two, three in power. And then I just need to simplify my results. All right, let's calculate this. Negative one cubed, negative one cubed is gonna be negative one, so that'll be easy. Negative one squared is positive one, and then so I have three i times the square root of three. So plus three times i times the square root of three. The second term is three times negative one, that's negative three. And then I have to do i times the square root of three squared. So I'll have i squared times square root of three squared, which is three, so three i. And then I'll over here have an i cubed times the square root of three cubed. forgot something, what's missing? I squared, this one is an I squared. So all the higher powers of I, I can replace with an I to the first. So I is just the square root of negative one. That's bad grammar, I am the square root of negative one. So I is just I, but we know that I squared is gonna be negative one. I to the third, is gonna be an i squared times an i, and i squared is negative one. 
So I cubed is negative I. So I'm gonna replace this I squared with negative one and this I cubed with negative I. So I have negative one, not gonna mess with that. Three I times the square root of three. And then um, I squared is negative one. So I have negative three times another negative three. Now over here, I've got this I cubed, which is just negative one times I. So that's a negative I. And I've got to fix this square root of three cubed. So if I think about the square root of three cubed, I can think of this as the square root of three squared times another square root of three to the first power in the same way I thought of I cubed as I squared times I. And that's how exponents work. The reason I would want to do this is that the square root of three squared is just three. So this square root of three cubed is three times the square root of three. And now we see what we got. Let's see what we got. So we've got negative one plus three i times the square root of three minus times minus is plus nine minus three i times the square root of three. And that gives us eight. So negative one plus i times the square root of three is equal to eight. So negative one plus i times the square root of three is one of the complex cube roots of eight. Any questions? The biggest block between you and the rest of math right now is probably your algebra. I mean, we got to do all this trig. You're going to go through this class called pre-calculus, but like all the classes that come before calculus are kind of like pre-calculus. I don't know why we're calling it pre-calculus. I think it's just because we didn't want to call it some other algebra class. We didn't want to just call it like more algebra. When everybody's be like, all, oh man, I've seen this movie already. This is just algebra. And yet we go watch The Force Awakens and that was the same as episode four, just with like new people in it and better effects. And we're still like super excited for that. So I don't know what the problem is. I think it's just because there's fewer lightsabers in math. Incidentally, Star Wars fans that are complaining that The Force Awakens was too much like A New Hope don't realize that when things become different, everybody complains. So what's the studio gonna do? They're just gonna do more of the same. Star Wars fans are like, oh yes, give us more of the same. And then more of the same shows up, oh, this is just more of the same. And the studio's like, oh, uh, guys, that's what you wanted. I mean, let's not forget that this is Disney now. And Disney's like, well, shut up. We know what you want. So just take it. I don't mind making fun of the Star Wars fan base. I know this might include you, but uh, if, you, if it does, I'm not even sorry. The Star Wars fan base is probably one of, if not the most toxic fan bases in all of fan bases. All other fan bases look at Star Wars and say, ugh. And this is coming from someone in the Star Wars fan base who has some toxic viewpoints. And I'm trying to get better. You know what I mean? Anyway, so we found that negative one plus i times the square root of three cubed gave us eight. So that means that this must be a cube root 
one of the complex cube roots of eight. Similarly, negative one minus i times the square root of three cubed is equal to eight. What's gonna happen is that these i square roots of three are gonna become minus, and this is minus, and this is minus. Some signs flip around, but we still end up with eight. You should check for yourself because it's still only a couple lines long. And this way, if you weren't clear on what I was doing in these four lines, you can become clear by trying it with this other one. But most importantly, we've found the three cube roots of eight. Let's come at this from an algebra side. We're trying to solve x cubed equals eight. The equivalent equation is x cubed minus eight equals zero. The reason I want one side to be zero is because I'm gonna apply my mad skills in factoring polynomials. Because if I can make a product equal to zero, that tells me that one or more of the factors must be equal to zero. If a product is zero, then one of the factors is zero. It's like the mathematical locked room mystery. If we're all locked in a room and one of us dies, then one of us is a murderer. Or if one of us is murdered, then one of us is a murderer. So um, we can factor this with the difference of cubes, which I'm sure everybody remembers. Let's double check my work because you're asking me to remember something and that's always fishy. Let's multiply x squared plus two x plus four by x minus two. I'm not gonna foil because there's gonna be too much inner. It'd be like foil, there's too much i. So I'm just gonna multiply. I got a negative eight minus four x minus two x squared plus four x, that cancels nicely, plus a two x, oh, it's two x squared, so that cancels and then a plus x cubed. So looks like everything checks out. This is the correct factorization. Now this means we have a product that equals zero. So one of these factors must be zero. The first one tells us what we already know that x, e x minus two equals zero. And so x equals two, that's our real zero. We knew that was showing up. What we need to find out is that this x squared plus two x plus four should have solutions of negative one plus or minus i times the square root of three. Let's find out. So we also need to solve x squared plus two x plus four is equal to zero. Now, this is not a factorable quadratic. I can't find nice, fact, uh, I can't find nice factors of four whose sum is equal to two. I can't find real factors of four whose sum is equal to two. So we're gonna have to go with the complex ones. You might be expecting me to break out the quadratic formula, but I'm totally not gonna do that because the quadratic formula is trash. I'm, there's a leading coefficient of one and your X coefficient is even. So if you don't complete the square on this, I don't know what's wrong with you. You've been corrupted by this quadratic formula. It's like a cult, I tells you. So this is just an X squared plus two X plus one is what completes the square and that leaves behind a three. And now we can already see that we're gonna be correct because there's that plus or minus square root of negative three that's gonna show up. The x squared plus two x plus one is where we're gonna get the negative one because that's just x plus one squared. So subtract three from both sides, take the square roots, and then subtract one from both sides. We have a negative under a radical, and that just means that there's a factor of negative, uh, there's a factor of square root of negative one. 
and that's equal to i. So negative one plus or minus i times the square root of three. So there are our three zeros. Here are three complex zeros. Here's the one real zero. And here are our two complex non-real zeros. Wow, the algebra class, the algebra stuff and the trig stuff fit together so well right in all this polar coordinate business. So we found the three complex cube roots of eights from a polar coordinate standpoint using a conjecture that we made yesterday about the nth roots of a complex number. And we also did the problem from the algebra side. We did have to remember some factoring or we did just have to know that two was a zero of the polynomial x cubed minus eight. So that tells us that x minus two is a factor of the polynomial. So we didn't have to remember the factoring if we already knew one of the zeros. So just on another algebra note, If you forgot the factorization of the difference of cubes, that's okay. We can still apply algebra to this problem. The reason it's okay is that we know that two is a zero of the x cubed minus eight. So we know that x minus two is a factor of x cubed minus eight. So if we divide x cubed minus eight by x minus two, that will tell us what the other factor is. If we don't remember the factorization of x cubed minus eight, we can just divide. So I'm gonna take x minus two and divide it into x cubed, zero x squared, zero x and eight. Cause I'm gonna use the same long division process that we're already familiar with. When we write polynomials, we don't fill in the zeros but when we write numbers, we have to put the zeros in. So I know I'm looking at 1,008, or sorry, 1,000 and negative eight, and not just uh, negative 18, or teen and negative eight. I gotta put those zeros in to say zero hundreds, zero tens, but 1,000. So we just divide. Uh, x cubed divided by x is x squared. And then we multiply x times x squared is x cubed minus two x squared. And then we subtract. The x cubes cancel, that's part of the plan. Zero minus a negative two is two x squared. And then two x squared divided by x is plus two x and it's all coming together. Then we get a two at multiply to get a two x squared minus 4x, which we subtract. The 2x squareds cancel out just like we planned. 0 minus a negative 4 is plus 4x. And then x goes into 4x four times. 4 times x is 4x. 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. And when we subtract, we get a remainder of 0. 
which we had to get because we knew that x minus two was in fact a factor of x cubed minus eight. We have a powerful piece of information knowing that two is one of the cube roots of eight because now we also have a factor of the polynomial x cubed minus eight and we can divide to get the other factor. Any questions? Incidentally, this, uh, this polynomial business is the same kind of stuff that we do when we're dealing with numbers. If I want to divide seven into um, I'm going to start with something bigger. So let's say uh, 851. The words that we say are that seven goes into eight one time. Is there anybody had some, some of you might have different words for this, but this is the incantation that I was programmed with back when I was a kid. They said seven goes into eight one time. Then you multiply the one times seven and put that under the eight. And it wasn't until I had to explain this crazy process to someone why it works. So, because someone's like, oh, wait, what do you mean seven goes into eight one time? I'm like, all right, all right, you're right, you're right. There's no eight, that's an 800. How many times can you subtract seven from 800 without going negative? And well, 100 times. If I do 200 times, that would be, uh, if I tried 200 sevens, that would be 1400. That's way too much. But 100 sevens is just 700 because what that one represents in that spot above the eight is 100. And 100 times seven is 700. That's what we're subtracting. We're saying, how many times can you subtract seven from 851 without going negative? And we just do it in pieces. Let's first start off by taking 100 sevens away from the 851. 851 minus 700, or 100 sevens, other way around, minus 100 sevens is 151. Now we focus on the 15 part. How many times can we subtract seven from 15? Well, we can do that twice. But what we're actually doing is subtracting seven from 150 20 times. We can do more than 20, but just in the tens point place, we can subtract 20. So it's really 20 times seven is 140. We would just write the one, the 14, but really it's 140. 151 minus 140 is 11. And then we say, how many times can we subtract seven from 11 without going negative? And the answer is once. And one times seven is seven. And 11 minus seven is four. Now we can't subtract seven from four without going negative. So we say our answer is 121 and four sevenths. But the question is, how many times can we subtract seven from 851 without going negative? We can do that 121 times and there will be four left over. Note that you, if you remember what things represent, you can't mess this up. This is a sidetrack into arithmetic. But if you remember what thing, these things are supposed to represent, you can't mess it up. Let's suppose I get to the end and for whatever reason, uh, I got 851. Uh, I subtract 700 and then I have 151 and then I'm gonna subtract 140 and end up with 11. 
Let's suppose I mess up. I'm gonna subtract seven from 11 twice. Rebel. Because as any adult student knows, you can absolutely subtract 14 from 11. Ask anybody in debt. And you can absolutely take 14 away from 11. Because you're like, oh, I have $11. And the bank is all, well, we need to take $14 away from you. And then you're like, oh, but I learned in school, you can't take 14 from 11. And the bank is like, oh, uh, watch us. You now have negative three. And you might be thinking, oh, but now your answer is all stupid because it looks like 122 and minus three sevenths. But what's 122 minus three sevenths? If we write it like a normal person, we would just say 121 and four sevenths. Can't mess it up if you understand the process. And once you understand this process, you can go right over to the polynomials and ask the same questions. How many times can I subtract x from x cubed? Well, to subtract an x from x cubed, I have to make them like terms. So I'm gonna to have to multiply by an x squared. x squared times x is x cubed. That's what I need to do to make that subtraction happen. Algebra is just arithmetic with base x instead of base 10. All these little kids are running around. It's like, oh, I know how to count. I'm like, oh, oh, that's awesome. Show me. And they're like, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm like, oh, what six? Start over, but this time count in base five. And they're like, oh, what? I'm like, oh, I guess you don't know how to count, do you? I'm actually never say this to children. If a kid is excited to tell me that they know how to count, I just let them because that kind of thing should be encouraged. If I call, I learned a thing and now I'm excited and I wanna share it with you. You be excited for that kid. I don't care how boring that kid is. You be excited for them. Make sure that the thing that they learn that they wanna share with you is celebrated. You know what I mean? I don't even have a kid and that one is obvious to me. <laughs> if the kid is, is in debt, then make sure that you're nice to them, but like corporate nice. Here at Banking Megacorp, we care about our clients. <laughs> Celebrate, but put $10 on the card, yes. <laughs> you learned something, how much did it cost? Now, was that really worth it? That's what I thought. Now, shut up and go do your factory job until we don't need you anymore. Any questions? I think that, that's the biggest thing. Just when, when the kid is like, has learned something and they're excited to share it, be excited with them. Tell them that they are correct. Because if you look at down on them at that moment, you're telling them that their excitement for learning is wrong and they will get that message. You don't have to say it explicitly. They'll know. Eventually they'll figure out that you're faking it, but hopefully, You'll be good enough at faking it that you can last until by the time they figure out that you're faking it, they're like, well, oh, I see why they were doing that. Because now as my, my nice elastic brain starts to harden in place, because I'm in college now, I'm still excited to learn. I've built that habit and they helped me do that. So don't be mad at them for lying to you. Or they shouldn't be mad at you for lying to them. You know what I mean? Some people say that I shouldn't have an opinion on raising kids because I don't have any kids. But I tell you, that's the exact opposite. Because I don't have any kids, I don't have a stake in this. I can actually look at child rearing objectively. People that have children can't look at it objectively. They have kids. 
they want to convince themselves that they're doing it right. You know what I mean? I'm actually not claiming that I, ha I know any better than anybody else. I'm just saying, you don't get to write off my opinion just because I don't have kids. If that was really the case, we need to start dismissing everybody that complains about math. All of you that are like, oh, boo hoo, I can't teach my kid math. Like, well, if you suck at math, maybe you shouldn't be trying to teach your kid, teach your kid math. And you know what? That'll be a better lesson for the kid anyway. So if you're a parent and you don't know how to do your kid's math homework and you can't help them with their math homework, you suck it up and you say, sorry, kid, I can't help you with this one. I don't know that one. What do you think is the answer? And then have them try to explain it to you. You know what I mean? And if the kid's like, oh, well, I don't know. You got to ask them, what can we try to figure out this problem? Because if the response to I don't know is that they freeze and stop doing anything, that's the sign of the trauma, the mathematical trauma that we assign to people where we make them feel bad for getting things wrong. And so now they're afraid of getting things wrong because we've negatively, uh, we've punished them for being wrong. So they don't want to do that. We should celebrate when they're wrong. Kids like all oh, 122 and negative three sevenths. We should go, oh man, that's funny. Look, we subtract 11 minus 14, we got negative three. That's not how it works, is it? And they're like, oh, no. And they're like, ha, that's funny. And then you high five each other. It's like when a kid like bonks his head and he's like, ow. And then he looks to the adults. If the adults start laughing, the kid's like, oh, well, I guess that was funny. And they go, ha, ha. But if the parents are all freaking out because the kid bonked their head, then the kid's going to freak out. You know what I mean? Yeah. You learn more from your mistakes than from your confusion. Your confusion is just going to, can't let you, you can't let that stop you. You have to take that confusion and mold it into a mistake so that you could learn something. You know what I mean? Is it really this hard? I don't know. How's everybody okay? I think the end result is that I needed not a second coffee, but like a one and a half coffee. I also switched the brand and this brand is way stronger than the one I just had. This is the danger of going to a, the coffee aisle in the supermarket and say, oh, ooh, that looks good. And then just grabbing it. Any questions on our original topic? I started to meander there a little bit, partially due to the over-caffeination, but these are the strings of things that come together. Look how far back this one problem went. It's supposed to be a trig question where we're finding the cube roots of eights. Look at all the places that this one simple problem goes. If we limit ourselves to real numbers, then it's two. Two cubed is eight, end of story. But we've taken that same question and we've added to it with these complex numbers. And we viewed those complex numbers using trigonometry and using algebra. And we looked at the algebra as arithmetic because they're all connected. Any questions? Comments? Snide remarks? I tell you, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has got nothing on the Mathematical Cinematic Universe. If you're paying attention, you get references all the time to all the movies that you saw before. 
you start watching the algebra movie. Ooh, have you heard algebra one comes along? It's in phase two of the mathematical cinematic universe. And if you watch the algebra movie carefully, you'll notice, hey, this multiplying polynomials thing, that's the same thing that happened way back when. And then you're like, well, is this the same movie where the hero just fights a copy of themselves? And the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Mathematical Cinematic Universe, just like the Marvel Cinematic Universe is like, oh, no, 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 yes. Yes, it is. It is exactly that. But this hero has different powers. Ergo, the villain has different powers, even though they're the same as the hero. And if we do it right, the villain will have different motivations. And if we do it really right, the villain will have different motivations that we actually agree with. Any questions, comments, snide remarks? If you can't tell, this really is my favorite chapter in Trig. This is where stuff really starts to come together. And it really starts to, um, we really start to have this opportunity to see how well connected all these pieces in all these different classes um, come together. And to be able to do that as early in your mathematical career as trigonometry, I think is super. And I really like that. Any questions, comments, deep thoughts? Favorite superhero is a very difficult question because it's always in flux. I used to have like the super basic run of the mill opinions about different heroes. Like I used to like really not think Superman was, I, I thought Superman was stupid. Well, this, this is stupid. Um, he's invincible. I mean, when you get the, that player in your D&D campaign, you're just like, oh, ugh, this person's gonna be a problem. But then I watched Kill Bill volume two and I thought, holy crap, I had not thought about it that way. And now I like Superman, <laughs> specifically because Clark Kent. <laughs> like, oh, he thinks we all, we suck. He says, ah, oh, I need to hide amongst these people. Oh, I'll just be weak. I'm like, oh man, nailed it. Because people are like, oh, well, he puts the glasses on and he still looks like Christopher Reeve, but it's more than that. It's not just his appearance. He puts the glasses on and starts acting like a human. So we don't see him as Superman. I like Batman in, but only so far as the, really I prefer Batman to be the world's greatest detective. That's what he's billed as. And then in all these Batman movies, he does no detective work. He just beats people up. I mean, that's how you make a more interesting movie, I guess, but, you know, with just beating people up. It's like you could never make a successful movie where someone just investigates and applies logic and looks for clues and follows hunches. That would never work as a movie. They, they need Kung Fu to happen. You know what I mean? Any questions? Like math questions. So I can talk about like superhero movies like too much. All right. Well, then if that's the case, uh, I've made some assignments from chapter eight, which is gonna be the last chapter. So once you finish up these assignments, then all you have to do is wait for, um, wait for me to update some more quizzes that will serve as the final exam. And then we can be done with trigonometry. And then you can go on to pre-calculus and then on to calculus one and two and three and linear algebra and differential equations. But at that point, you'll be ready to start taking math classes. So that'll be great. 
All right, that's going to do it for today. That's going to do it for this week. I'll see you all on Tuesday. Everybody have a good weekend, and thanks for playing.